Thank you to the organizers for having me here. I'm gonna be talking about angular momentum transport in stars, which is a subject that has really accelerated a lot over the last decade. As with all the subjects uh, in these intro talks, it's a broad one. There's a lot of work, a lot of work I've missed, so I apologize to everybody whose work I didn't get a chance to speak about today. But the basic problem has been known for a long time, which is that as stars evolve, they tend to change their structure. So typically, the cores of stars contract as they evolve, the envelopes often expand. So if you conserve angular momentum in each part of the star, you tend to wind up with a very rapidly rotating core and a very slowly rotating envelope. That means you have a lot of shear in the star. And that shear can do interesting things, like it can cause mixing, which we heard about uh, yesterday from uh, Corinne and Isabel. Uh, it can do other things too, like generate instabilities, hydrodynamic or MHD instabilities, which then feed off of that shear and force a torque to, to reduce the amount of shear and bring the star closer to a level of rigid rotation. And that process is extremely important for understanding both the level of differential rotation and shear mixing inside of stars, but also things like the spins of compact objects, um, white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes that are born out of the cores of stars. If you just look at the amount of angular momentum in the core of a main sequence star and assume it's conserved into a white dwarf or neutron star black hole, you typically predict extremely rapid rotations for those objects, which is not what we see. So I'll be discussing that, but clearly a lot of angular momentum is transported within stars as they evolve. So let me start with data, and I'll discuss the helioseismic data, which has been around for a long time. And we've already seen a couple times. So, so what you see in the sun is that the convective envelope rotates differentially. Uh, there's some beautiful data, very nice measurements, both latitudinal and radial differential rotation in the convective envelope. And in the radiative core, basically, as far as we can tell, all the radiative core rotates nearly rigidly, uh, maybe a few percent deviation at the most. We don't have very good uh, measurements for the core, so like, I think there's some measurements that have pushed down this lower boundary to a little bit uh, deeper within the sun, but we don't really know what the rotation looks like in the inner 25% or so of the sun. But the part of the radiative core we can see rotates approximately rigidly. And again, that's in order to explain that, you need some efficient angular momentum transport in the sun, uh, which I'll come back to. We're also getting some beautiful astroseismic data from missions like Kepler. Uh, so this is some nice work done by Gong Li and Timothy Van Reith, where they've looked at Gamma Doradus stars. And in those stars, you can measure basically a, a bulk rotation rate of the star from the G modes, and that is mostly weighted towards the core rotation rate. That's where those modes have most of their inertia. So you mostly get a measurement of the core rotation rate from the gravity modes in those stars. And then some of those stars, you can also measure a surface rotation rate from things like spot modulations, or if you have a V sine I measurement, you can see if that's consistent with the core rotation rate. And what they find for the stars that they can measure is that most of them, the core rotation rate, is almost the exact same as the surface rotation rate. So the ratio is roughly equal to one. And for a larger sample of stars, they found that almost all those rotate within a few percent. The core and surface rotates within a few percent of each other. It's not exactly one. These, these measurements are quite precise. So it's enough to say that, you know, some of these stars do not rotate exactly rigidly. There is some shear. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is at the very left edge of this plot, there are some points where the core and envelope appear to rotate at extremely different rates. And these are extremely slow rotators, which is interesting. It's a hint about what's going on. Um, but for most of the stars that rotate pretty rapidly, they rotate nearly rigidly. So the other place where astroseismic data has been incredibly helpful is for subgiants, red giants and red clump stars, where the mixed modes that we see are modes that penetrate deep into the cores of the star. So we actually get a very beautiful measurement of the core rotation rate from the um, splitting 
the rotational splitting of dipole modes that we see in the pulsation spectra of those stars. I think Charlotte uh, will talk about this later. This is a plot from her paper uh, where they have measured the core rotation rates for, for hundreds of red giant stars. All these triangles are stars going up the red giant branch. The circles are clump stars. And it turns out these rotation periods are something like 10 days for the core of the star. And for the clump stars, it's closer to 100 days. Um, so I'll come back to these data. Uh, but you also notice there's a big scatter here. There's not any obvious trends with mass. So we don't totally understand this. And I'll show some of Jamie's results. Jamie is emphatically gesturing. Um, so we'll come back to this idea as well. So here's a plot from, from Jamie's paper showing some measurements of surface and core rotation rates of clump stars. These are all secondary clump stars. Um, so these are stars of roughly two to three solar masses where we can get good core rotation rates from the modes. And then you can try to measure the surface rotation rate from things like spots. And so for stars where, they, where Jamie could make this measurement, uh, there's some scatter, but typically the surface is rotating at periods something like twice the rotation rate of the core. So there's pretty strong coupling, but again, there is significant differential rotation there. Jamie tried to correct for uh, selection biases, so I think she inferred that you were actually missing some of the slow rotators uh, when you measure rotation periods from spots. And so the inference is that the typical ratio of surface to core rotation rate is something like two, but again, with a lot of scatter. So Connie Ertz has a nice review paper from a couple of years, uh, putting a lot of this together. And again, what we see for main sequence stars, especially rapid rotators, is they rotate almost rigidly. Whereas you, when you look at evolved stars like subgiants and red giants, the core might rotate 10 times faster than the surface, roughly. Uh, for clump stars, it's more like twice. The core rotates about twice as fast as the surface. And then there are some of these very slow rotators on the main sequence that rotate very differentially, uh, which are kind of anomalous. So I don't want to go over this in detail except to say that exactly where the differential rotation exists in these stars is not, is not clear. It's not clear if it's in the envelope in the convective envelope, or if it's somewhere deeper in the core. There have been some attempts to constrain that. So this is a nice paper by Hannah Cleon and Elliot Quadert, which I maybe, maybe I'll try to come back to explain this. But they infer it probably the differential rotation is mostly in the radiative core. But this is for one star. And it's very difficult to actually localize where the shear in the star actually is. So that's a brief summary of the data. And turns out that basically none of the theories we have can explain this data. Uh, so, so this was realized by Matteo several years ago that most of our existing models totally fail to, to match any of this data. So what you see here are predictions of various models for what the core rotation period should be as a function of the radius. So stars are evolving to the right on this plot. The astroseismic data that we had at the time is plotted right here. So again, these are core rotation periods of something like 10 days. If you look at models that only have hydrodynamic um, angular momentum transport mechanisms, so that would be like shear instabilities. I think that includes GSF, although I'm not sure. Um, meridional circulation. Then you predict very little angular momentum transport. You predict the core should be rotating something like 100 times faster than the data. So, so clearly, we need more angular momentum transport than those models. The next best thing we had at the time was the taylor sproit dynamo. Uh, so that's a magnetic instability, which I'll come back to. So you get magnetic torques. Those are predicted to be a little bit stronger, but those predict rotation periods in this stage of evolution of something like a day. So there's still time, still about 10 times too fast. Uh, so, so this definitely begged the question of needing new models to understand how angular momentum is transported. Okay, there's some other peculiar clues uh, from the data. 
So we've also had beautiful measurements of just huge samples of surface rotation rates of stars, especially a lot of stars in clusters. So here's some results from Jason Curtis, which I think uh, Jen Van Sater spoke about earlier in the program. But what you see is these are, uh, as you go up in this plot, we're looking at clusters that are older and older, and the stars spin down as they evolve. But what you see is that uh, NGC 6811 and Precipi, which are different in age, bizarrely have about the same rotation periods for uh, things like F stars and K stars, but quite different for stars like the sun. Um, and this is quite strange. So it's like these stars spin down, but all the other stars pause in their spin down for a few hundred million years. And this can potentially be explained by core envelope decoupling. So this is overlaying some models from Spada and Lanzafeim, uh, where they have basically a core envelope decoupling time so that basically angular momentum is transmitted from, uh, from the core to the envelope with some delay time, uh, which is a parameter of the models. And if you pick an appropriate delay time, you can basically match this kind of distribution uh, such that, well, at least you get pretty close to matching this kind of uh, effect where you see the G stars keep spinning down, but these stars have a long enough core envelope decoupling time that basically um, the envelope at this point in time is sort of just starting to get some new angular momentum from the core. Uh, so even though it's being magnetically braked at the surface, it's also getting an influx of angular momentum from the core, so it stays rotating at about the same rate. So you can make kind of simple two-zone models that are approximately consistent uh, with the data, and people have actually been thinking about that idea for a long time. So there's many authors who have worked on this idea, uh, motivated by measurements of rotation periods and clusters that we had before, and looking at the distributions. Um, so this is a more recent work by Garrett Sommers, which looks at rotation periods of stars uh, in a few different clusters with different ages. And what you see is that if you put in a model of a star that's rotating rigidly, which would be the solid line, then what you predict is kind of at intermediate times, you predict that the rotation rate uh, is is too fast. And so what you need in order to match the data is you need the envelope to be decoupled from the core such that it spins down faster because it's still getting magnetically braked at the surface, but it's not coupled to the core. So its effective moment of inertia is small. So it spins down very rapidly. But then at late times, after many of these um, core envelope coupling time scales, you're brought into rigid rotation. And that's what you need to match the sun, which as we see in the interior, the rate of interior is rotating at about the same rate as the convective envelope. Uh, you also need basically this core envelope decoupling time to depend on the rotation rate of the star. So to match the rapid rotators, uh, I think you need a shorter core envelope coupling time. Um, so this, and some of these other works have also pointed out that you and this work by Garrett also point out that you need this coupling time scale to scale very strongly with the stellar mass. So that coupling time scale needs to be something like 30 million years for the sun in order to explain the data. But for slightly lower mass stars, it has to be much longer. For slightly higher mass stars, it has to be much shorter. Um, the other interesting thing about this mechanism that Garrett points out in this paper is that if you make these kinds of models where you just put in some diffusivity, some angular momentum diffusivity, it gives you about the right core envelope coupling time scale. Those models have enough shear to produce mi enough mixing to destroy lithium at about the right rate that's observed in these stars. So there's sort of multiple lines of evidence that point for this decoupling. Uh, and I'll say it's a little hard to understand this in light of the astro-seismic measurements we have of red giants where there's much more core envelope coupling than we had expected. 
So it's a little hard to put all of these pieces of data together in one self-consistent theory that can explain everything. So let me talk a little bit about the mechanisms that we know about that can transport angular momentum. So if you just look at the phi component of a momentum equation, which basically tells you how the rotation rate of part of the star rotates, um, how, that evolution, how that rotation rate evolves, there's basically a few forces that can affect it. One is a Reynolds stress, so a correlated radial and phi velocity. So that could be produced by things like meridional circulation. Uh, it could be produced by things like gravity waves that propagate through a star that carry angular momentum. You can also have things like instabilities, shear instabilities that effectively generate some kind of turbulence. And often that's try, people try to uh, encapsulate that turbulence as some sort of effective angular momentum viscosity within the star. So usually the microscopic viscosity is totally negligible for angular momentum transport. But if you have some instability that creates an effective viscosity, that can create an effective viscous stress um, that transports angular momentum. And the other ingredient, which can be very important in stars, is magnetic fields. So there can be a Maxwell stress. And historically, a lot of people have tried to avoid that issue because it's more complicated. Um, but as all, you know, as these measurements have motivated, um, we need a lot of angular momentum transport. We, re we really need to think about magnetic mechanisms, which in a lot of situations can be more effective than hydrodynamic torques, which I'll explain why in just a second. So, so one of the issues is that the rotation that we see in stars, especially in evolved stars, is actually extremely slow in the sense that if you look at things like the, rel the ratio, so this is a very complicated plot. I just want you to look at the red line, which is a model for the core rotation rate of a red giant star as a function of radius within the star. We know from data that the core rotation rate is something like 10 to the minus five radians per second. And the brunt visala frequency within, within the star, which basically tells you how much work you need to do to overturn the stratification, that's something like three or four orders of magnitude larger than the rotation rate. And that means the ratio of rotational energy to you know, buoyant energy is actually that ratio squared. So that's like 10 to the six to 10 to the eight. So there's not near enough energy in the rotation or, or in the shear to overturn the stratification of the star and directly produce mixing. You need to somehow get around the stratification in order to produce any radial motion. So uh, basically what I'm saying is in order to produce any radial motion, you need to do work against that buoyancy. Uh, so it's very hard for, this VR tends to be extremely small for any kind of instability uh, because it needs to do work against that stratification. Uh, the other issue that's extremely important, especially for evolved stars, is that this stratification, it's not just a thermal stratification, it has a big component from compositional stratification. So that's what this dashed blue line is, is that's the compositional part of the brunt visala frequency, which is right here is the hydrogen burning shell where the stratification is mostly due to the composition uh, gradient. And this is important because the composition, you can't just, um, the thermal stratification can be overcome if you wait for a thermal time. So for instance, if you displace a fluid element and then let heat diffuse out of it, it will effectively feel no buoyancy force. But if you wanna do the same thing to overcome a compositional gradient, you have to wait for the composition to diffuse out of your element. And composition diffuses orders of magnitude more slowly so it's really hard for many mechanisms to overcome the compositional gradient that we have, especially in post-main sequence stars. So a lot of instabilities that are aided by thermal diffusion, like some uh, diffusion-aided shear instabilities or GSF, those often rely on thermal diffusion to overcome buoyancy forces, but that doesn't work if you have a large composition gradient. So this is a big issue. And so this compositional stratification at the hydrogen burning shell in red giants is a big bottleneck for angular momentum transport mechanisms. So, like I said, I think it's important to look at magnetic mechanisms 
um, which has, those mechanisms have received renewed interest. And one of the reasons why magnetic fields are so important is that even a very weak field will be amplified into a strong field if you have differential rotation in your star. So if you just look at the magnetic induction equation, if you have some shear, which this Q here is a dimensionless shear, it's like dLn omega dLn r. So if you have any shear and any radial component of your magnetic field, that radial magnetic field will get wound up by the shear, right? It'll get wound up into a toroidal field. And that's what you see in this uh, nice simulation by Juve and company in 2015. Basically any, even a very weak radial field gets wound up steadily over time into a very strong toroidal magnetic field. And so that means the Maxwell stress you get increases with time as your toroidal field gets stronger and stronger. So that means even with a very weak starting magnetic field, if you have any shear, you tend to increase your magnetic torques until those torques are going to start to become relevant and feed back and try to reduce the shear. So this brings us to the idea of the taylor Sproit dynamo, which uh, Hank Sproit had about two decades ago now. Um, so the idea here is that you start with a weak radial magnetic field, you wind it up into a toroidal field, and so you can think of that basically as just loops of toroidal magnetic field. And we've known for a long time that a purely toroidal field will be unstable uh, if there's no poloidal field to restrict the motion. And so those loops above a critical field strength, those loops will become unstable and they'll start to slip sideways relative to each other. And that's the Taylor instability. And because they're slipping sideways relative to each other, they're generating components of the magnetic field in the theta and r directions. Okay, so you're definitely, by the action of the instability, you'll then alter the, the rate, the poloidal component of the field in the star. Uh, and the question is, how does that instability saturate and what kind of mean magnetic fields does it end up producing at the end of that saturation process? And that's a very complicated question. It depends on the, how this instability saturates, the nonlinear saturation or turbulent saturation mechanism uh, that occurs. So we, you know, we know there's a linear instability, but the nonlinear evolution is quite complicated. And so this is what Sproit, uh, described in his 2002 paper, the taylor sproit dynamo. It was a model for how the instability saturates. And uh, the argument is that the growth rate of the instability, which goes like an alpha and frequency squared divided by the rotation rate, um, will saturate once you have some nonlinear damping that's roughly equal to the linear growth rate. Uh, and then the argument based on an energy balance was that the amount of energy you dissipate is basically that nonlinear damping rate times your background field energy density, which is B phi squared. And when that is equal to the amount of energy you're putting into the uh, background field due to the winding, due to the differential rotation, that's when statistically you'll saturate the instability. Um, and you can also estimate that the radial component of the field relative to the phi component of the field should go something like the alpha and frequency over the brunt by solid frequency. That's because that's approximately the ratio of vertical to horizontal displacements to, created by this instability. So you can put these equations together and solve for what BR, B phi should be, and therefore what the Maxwell stress should be. Um, and you get that it scales something like rotation rate over brunt by solid frequency to the fourth power. So this is in the limit that, uh, that basically this stratification is, is just due to say compositional stratification and there's no diffusion to get around that. Uh, so like I said, so basically there's an effective angular momentum viscosity that scales with rotation to brunt by solid frequency to the fourth power. I said that this ratio is very small, right? This is like 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four. So that means you'd actually don't end up getting very much torque, very much viscosity from this, especially where the brunt by solid frequency is large within the star or near the hydrogen burning shell. 
Um, so, so that's why this mechanism didn't produce enough torque to match the data we see for red giants. It does produce enough torque to match the data we see for a lot of the main sequence stars, uh, but in the post-main sequence, it does, is not consistent with data. So this motivated uh, me and Adam and Tony Pyro to think about more deeply about how this instability might saturate. So our argument was the main difference between our work and Spreut's work is that we argue that the amount of energy that you actually dissipate due to um, due to this effective turbulent damping, it's not really the background magnetic field energy. It's only the energy that you that you have in kind of in the perturbed magnetic field. If you if you envision the background magnetic field as being a nice ordered magnetic field, you can't dissipate it by moving loops relative to each other, uh, because the loop the magnetic field is basically in the same direction. So you can't just reconnect all the magnetic energy away. So we argue that you can only dissipate the the energy contained in the unstable motions, um, and that's much less energy. And so we also have to estimate basically what a nonlinear damping rate is. Uh, and we argue that it should be something like a uh, alpha n velocity divided by radius, which is like an effective alpha n frequency in the perturbed component of the magnetic field. That's due, due to a cascade of energy due to alpha n wave interactions. And so when you put these ingredients all together, uh, because basically you're dissipating less energy here, you end up allowing the field to grow to larger field strengths. And so you get a larger BR and a larger B phi at saturation. And so you predict a stronger effective angular momentum viscosity, which now only scales like omega over n to the second power instead of the fourth power. So you get more torque from this revised uh, prescription. So what we did was take this prescription. By the way, this prescription has a fudge factor like most of these prescriptions, it has an alpha, uh, which we think is some number of order unity. You know, these are all twiddle equations. There could be factors of unity that are very hard to predict from first principles. So this uh, effective viscosity scales uh, with alpha cubed, actually. Um, but we think this is some number of order one. So we're going to calibrate this model against the data. And indeed, actually, with alpha equals one, uh, you get some predictions that are pretty close to the data. So here's some models of the core rotation rate with this revised prescription put in. The black line is with the uh, original Taylor Sproit dynamo. And these ovals indicate approximate astroseismic rotation rates for red giants and for white dwarfs. Uh, and again, yeah, the Taylor Sproit dynamo over predicts rotation rates by about a factor of 10. This revised prescription does much better. It gets pretty close to both the red giants, the clumps, and the white dwarfs. But there are some issues, which I'm gonna come back to. But it certainly is getting closer. So it's, I think it's a appealing mechanism. Um, I, I'll just point out that this mechanism predicts that almost all the shear in the star is right at the hydrogen burning shell in red giants. That's because there's that big compositional gradient there that's where the brunt weiss olive frequency is largest, so that's where the effective angular momentum viscosity is smallest in these models. Uh, that's compatible with what we have from astroseismic data, but like I said before, this is just one possible rotation profile from an attempted inversion by DeMauro et al. 2017. What this rotation profile looks like is actually very unclear. So it's compatible with the data, but it would be great if we actually had rotation profiles. Like I said, this model predicts pretty close to the right white dwarf rotation rates, maybe a little bit too slow, and especially for the more massive white dwarfs, uh, it looks like it's predicting rotation periods that are too long. Um, so I'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, there's, there's some other issues as well. But if you put this uh, model into, say, a massive star, you can predict the amount of angular momentum contained in the core. So that's what my student Lin Hao did a few years ago. So these are some models of 10 to 40 solar masses 
they evolve off the main sequence right here. And you can see that these models predict that the core loses about 99% of its angular momentum right at the end of the main sequence. The reason it happens there is right at the end of the main sequence, the core contracts really fast on a thermal time, envelope expands really fast. So you have a lot of shear that allows the instability to transport a lot of angular momentum. So that's where the core loses its angular momentum, continues to lose a little bit. And we predict that the final angular momentum in the core corresponds to this right axis. This is rotation periods of neutron stars. If you just assume that the angular momentum in the core is conserved during the explosion process, it would give you a neutron star rotating at something like 100 milliseconds, which is pretty close to typical uh, birth rotation rates of, of radial pulsars. Uh, so this plot just shows that, that the rotation period predicted for neutron stars is something like 50 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds, depending on mass. Uh, by the way, with this mechanism, the core rotation rates are predicted to be very insensitive to the surface, ro the initial rotation rate of the star. That's actually a problem, which I'm going to come back to. But this model also predicts very slow black hole spins, so dimensionless spins of something like 10 to the minus 2. Uh, so very small. This is compatible at least to first order with the measurements we're getting from LIGO for black holes that are merging. Those black holes are mostly slowly rotating. Um, so that's at least qualitatively consistent with this data. There can be some other really interesting consequences of rapid angular momentum transport in stars. So this is some work uh, an undergraduate student, Zhi Wei, did with me a couple of years ago, which was in massive stars, what actually happens is when massive stars evolve off the main sequence, their core contracts a lot and their envelope expands, but the envelope is very, has a very small amount of mass. So the moment of inertia of the star actually decreases right at the end of the main sequence. And so that means if you have strong enough angular momentum transport to keep your star nearly rigidly rotating, what happens is a star that was rotating at below its breakup velocity ends up rotating above its breakup velocity right after the main sequence. And so we predicted basically centrifugally driven mass loss rates for massive stars, and those can be of order 10 to the minus four solar masses per year. So this can be very large. And so you might expect these stars to, to have decretion disks or to go through outbursts. And where we're predicting a lot of centrifugal mass loss is kind of near the LBV uh, instability region. Um, so it's, it's an exciting prospect for potentially explaining some of the weird variability that we see in massive stars. We're predicting a lot of those could be very rapidly rotating at the surface. Actually, these models are ones that accreted a little bit of mass, say, due to absorbing a small companion star at the end of the main sequence. Then they have a, plenty of angular momentum uh, for this process to occur. Um, so like I said, there's some issues with things like this new Taylor Sproit uh, dynamo. And this was pointed out by Eggenberger. Uh, when you look at rotation rates of subgiant stars that have been astroseismically measured, you can approximately match. So this is basically this revised Taylor Sproit dynamo. These are evolutionary curves compared with uh, some, some data points for subgiants. And if you choose the right alpha, I said we have this fudge factor of order unity, you can more or less match the behavior seen in subgiants. But then you basically way over predict the rotation rate for the red giant stars. Most of the red giant stars with core rotation rates are over here, so they're way under these tracks. You can use a larger alpha to get more angular momentum transport to match the giants, but then you miss the subgiants. So it's really hard to match both of those populations at the same time. Uh, and I think Jamie's working on a paper which is putting a lot of these models and a lot of this data together. And so these are core rotation rates of the big triangles are subgiants. I think they're new measurements from TESS. Uh, these are red giants uh, that we've seen before. And the dashed line is 
this model that I've worked on. And that does pretty well, but it's definitely missing the subgiants, like I mentioned before. Uh, the other model, which I'm going to come back to, is one with differential rotation in the envelope. Um, so I'll come back to this plot. But this model, it does okay as well, but also has some problems. So th another exciting idea is that you have um, differential rotation in the envelope. So this was suggested by Kisson and Thompson several years ago. The idea is that you have a power law differential rotation profile in your convective envelope, and you have a nearly rigidly rotating radiative core just because you have strong enough, uh, say, uh, fossil fields. You don't even need very strong magnetic fields in your radiative core to enforce rigid rotation. Even something like 10 Gauss is enough. So if your radiative core rotates rigidly, then you need differential rotation in the envelope. And so that's what this model does. It prescribes a power law differential rotation profile in the envelope, and that predicts rotation periods of the cores of these stars of something like 10 days along the red giant branch and something like 50 days on the clump, which is pretty close to the data. Uh, there are some issues, like if you apply the same model to a one solar mass star like the sun that has lost most of its angular momentum. It predicts rotation periods that are too long. And so coming back to this plot, this is uh, this prescription has also been used more or less in the same fashion by Takahashi and Langer a couple years ago. The problem with this model is that it predicts that the core rotation period should get quite a bit longer during the subgiant phase. Whereas what we see is the subgiants appear to actually spin up a little bit. Uh, so, so basically, none of these models does a great job of describing master seismic data. So we should look at other models. Uh, I'm running out of time, but I'll briefly mention that gravity waves are a nice prospect for transporting angular momentum to stars. As we've seen, if you have convection, that excites gravity waves that propagate through the radiative region of the star. The approximate energy flux of those gravity waves is something like the Mach number of the convection times the luminosity of the convection. The angular momentum flux scales like the azimuthal number, m, of the waves divided by the wave frequency. So if you have some model for basically the energy spectrum of the waves excited by convection, you can compute the angular uh, momentum flux and the characteristic time scale on which the waves could change the rotation rate of the star is basically the moment of a, sorry, it's the angular momentum, say, in your radio of core of your star, divided by this angular momentum flux. And that time scale can be quite short, can be of the order, can be less than a million years. So waves definitely can transport a lot of angular momentum. And this was explored several years ago uh, by Taylan and Charbonnel. So they were trying to explain the rotation profile of the sun. And so they showed if you start with large differential rotation in the sun, that gravity waves can transport enough angular momentum into the core of the sun to slow the spin down. The reason is that if you have a lot of angular moment, if you have a big amount of differential rotation, then what happens is uh, the waves that have the same sign of angular momentum as the differential rotation end up getting filtered out. So if you have a rapidly rotating core, what this means, is that only the retrograde waves, which have negative angular momentum, actually propagate into the core. And so that allows the, the core to be spun down when those retrograde waves damp and deposit their angular momentum in the core. So they showed that you can spin down the, the radiative core of the sun pretty effectively. But when you apply this to red giants, there's some issues, uh, which I'll just mention briefly, which is basically that like I said before, the brunt by solar frequency is very large in red giants. This means that the waves, the gravity waves, damp on very short length scales. And so it's actually hard for the waves to, to propagate all the way into the helium core of the star to spin it down. So this is something that I worked on several years ago with a bunch of people in this room. Uh, it's also been, yeah, so I'll just give you the point that Kind of to the left of these lines, the waves can propagate into the core and spin it down. To the right of these lines, where most of the measurements are, it's very difficult for the waves to transport enough angular momentum to spin down the cores. 
So this has also been looked at by Pinson and company. They found kind of a similar result that you can basically, basically what they're showing here is that you can spin down the cores of subgiants, uh, but for red giants, the waves can't produce little enough differential rotation to explain the data, at least not easily, not with our current understanding of the wave spectrum and wave damping. Uh, so running out of time, I just want to mention that if you start with rigid rotation, gravity waves can actually generate shear. And so you can do weird things like create counter rotating layers on stars, which might be consistent with some of these weird slow rotating main sequence stars that we see. So Tammy Rogers has worked on this. Uh, so has Rich Townsend, the pulsations of stars can do similar things. But I just want to emphasize that if you also have magnetic torques at the same time, those are going to try to restrict the amount of differential rotation generated by waves. So it's kind of a complicated process where m many of these mechanisms may interact with each other. So we need to be careful. Uh, Pascal also has an interesting mechanism, which I don't have enough time to talk about, except that it, it depends on angular momentum transport across a thin tachocline. I think the width of that tachocline is a parameter of the model, which is a little hard to predict. Um, but that could be an interesting prospect to explore further. And I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, we have this beautiful data, which is so suggestive. We can actually compare models to data now, uh, but so far we haven't been able to really understand what we're seeing. So we need more work to understand magnetic instabilities, like the Taylor instability and magnetic torques. We need to understand the spectrum of waves and how much angular momentum transport they produce inside of stars. And it'll be great to get more data from things like subgiants and SPB stars, which Jamie and Mai are working on, so that we get you know, a, a fuller picture of the core rotation rates of stars so that we can really pin down the mechanisms at work. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Do we have any questions in the audience? Thanks. Uh, this is Adrian Fraser. Uh, I've got a question about the Taylor Shroud stuff you talked about. Um, there's a nice paper by Jacqueline Goldstein a few years ago looking at how the analytic approximation can modify the growth rate of the instability. I think it can change it by a factor of five-ish off the top of my head. I forget. And I just wonder if that's like, is that a big enough change that it really uh, uh, is important to consider in trying to compare models with data? or is that washed out by either the fudge factor or the other scalings uh, in your model? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the growth rates that I've been considering are analytically computed, so they're not computed with an analytic approximation. Um, but certainly, those factors of order unity it, exist in, in any kind of model, right? These are all twiddles. Uh, so. Certainly factors of a couple are lingering in all these equations, and that definitely uh, produces a big uncertainty in the amount of torque you actually get. So this is one of the, the factors we really need to pin down with more detailed studies of the instability, of the saturation of the instability, hopefully with some simulations. So I'm working on a simulation. I think some other groups are also working on simulations of the Taylor instability uh, that will hopefully shed more light on whether or not any of this physics actually occurs. Um, but it, yeah, I think Jacqueline's paper is a good start on that. Uh, a question from Pascal Garreau about the uh, Gamma Dor stars. Uh, if I remember correctly, they showed nearly uniform rotation, but some of them had uh, F core over F surface greater than one. The question is that, uh, uh, first of all, are, are those surface rotation rates more sensitive to the equatorial rotation rate than the polar rotation rate? And if so, could you interpret those cases where this ratio is larger than one as being anti-solar differential rotation? Uh, that's a good question. I think the modes are a bit more sensitive to the equatorial 
the equator than the poles. It depends on their eigenfunctions, and they are mostly restricted to the equator. But these, so these core rotation rates are mainly coming from basically these Kelvin modes that we discussed before. They're like prograde L equal, sort of like the L equal one branch of, uh, of gravity modes. And those have a pretty broad eigenfunction, so they're not, they're not highly localized to the equator. Could this be? I think it's the surface yeah. measurement that oh, is the presumed surface, yeah. to be uh, dominated by the equatorial regions. I think we don't know. We, you see some periodicity on the light curve, and it's interpreted to be due to spots on the star. But where those spots are is not clear, at least I, in most I, cases. I know, at least in the Earth, that uh, almost the entire Earth is the equatorial region. So, okay, that's probably more likely, but some of you, we, we just don't know. Jim, many of us worry about stars that are accreting. Oh, sorry, Lars, Boltston, KITP. Um, yeah. Many of us worry about stars that accrete, um, all kinds of stars that accrete. And in that field, there's a, a huge diversity in choices people make on the viscosity and angular momentum of transport. So my question to you is, as you've learned all of this, uh, where there's data, do you, do you, is there any possibility of giving something that I would call a minimal expectation for an angular momentum viscosity in, in terms of omega, the radius, and n? Is there something one could say, if, if you go below this, then you're just, you're just not being realistic? If you go below this in terms of the amount of angular momentum viscosity? Yes, is there some minimal, is there, you know, so, so I think I think the field has evolved where, where people no longer do the hydrodynamic uh, viscosity and still, and, and can write a paper or give a talk and not have somebody sharply critique it. But now we've, we've got a new set of choices, right? But there, is there some minimal expectation that one would say, you know, if you're going below this, you're just not being realistic. I think that depends on who you ask. I would argue that it needs to be kind of of this order of magnitude. If it's much less than that, then that's not consistent with data we have in other cases. Um, so something like rotation rate divided by an effective brunt squared. I skipped over the fact that this effective brunt depends on things like the amount of thermal diffusivity and how much compositional stratification you have. So. This can actually change quite a bit from the actual brunt by solid frequency, so we can discuss that in detail if you'd like. But um, yes, I, I think that there can be a lot more angular momentum transport in accreting stars than has been considered in the past, especially since, you know, as you know, MRI doesn't work for transporting angular momentum from a rapidly rotating surface boundary layer into the core. But Taylor instability is agnostic to the sign of the differential rotation, so. It's a good candidate for that. Hi, Vicky Antochi here. Nice talk, Jim. Um, I think I know the answer to that question, but I want to make sure. Do you have any observations on the pre-main sequence? Um, I'm not aware of any. Does okay. anybody know? Um, yeah, define... surfaces, yes. Cores, that... go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the multifine rate, Kyo Leuven. Um, there was work uh, by um, Constance Swins, I believe, back in 2014, where she uh, did measure uh, rotation rates of delta scuti stars on the pre main sequence. But I'm not aware if uh, that sample has been extended since then. Those are astro seismic rotation rates? It's been a while, but I believe it was, yes. Okay. Well, if they're delta scuties, it's probably weighted towards the surface. So probably not core rotation rates. Hi, <clears throat> uh, Valentin Skutnev. Um, when, so when you consider uh, angular momentum transport by both uh, internal gravity waves and the Taylor Spruit at the same time, people consider the effect of the toroidal and pleural fields of the toroidal Spruit on the propagation of the waves themselves? Uh, so, I guess, first off, I don't think anybody has considered both those mechanisms at the same time. And like I said, there's 
a lot going on. It's hard to explain all the data. It might be that there's multiple mechanisms that dominate at different times. So I do think that's an interesting thing that we should study. In terms of how the magnetic fields affect the waves, uh, yes, there have been studies, and I've done some of those. Daniel has worked on that. Um, it turns out that the waves are much more sensitive to vertical fields than toroidal fields. So you need a really strong toroidal field to affect the waves, but that could be present in some cases. Um, but mostly the waves are sensitive to vertical fields. Uh, and we do see some evidence for strong magnetic fields in the cores of red giants that I didn't talk about today, where we think there's a strong enough radial magnetic field to, to totally uh, disrupt the gravity waves and basically turn them into alpha and waves. Um, so yeah, so there's lots of interesting physics there. But you had like a slide at the near the end that you mentioned had both waves and magnetic effects. So, uh, that, which slide? It was like, I don't know, third to last or something. Um, this one? Uh, that was like the differential rotation profile. Oh, yeah. And this, this is and the uh, sun, and then you had like one. I think this is Rich, Rich Townsend's paper, magnetic. which I had to skip over. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, so what Rich was looking at here was the amount of differential rotation that you just naturally create due to excitation of things like uh, slowly pulsating B star pulsations. Uh, because those are excited in some part of the star and damped in other parts of the star, they just naturally generate huge amounts of differential rotation in a very short amount of time. You see, this is like in a thousand years. Uh, but if you have some other mechanism like magnetic torques uh, that are operating at the same time, it may basically wash out that shear before you can generate it. So, I think that's quite likely, but it, it's not very clear. And this kind of mechanism might be a good prospect for creating the differential rotation that we do see in some slowly rotating stars. Cool. Thank you. Another question from Zoom from Pascal Garraud. Um, what is the magnetic diffusivity profile near the subgiant in RGB cores, uh, specifically because there's a transition from degenerate to non-degenerate fluid, uh, could a low magnetic Reynolds number a, or a change of magnetic Reynolds number affect the taylor sprout mechanism in that region? Uh, yes, I think it could. So from the magnetic diffusivities that I have looked at, uh, which were, which MESA calculates based on a, the original taylor sprout prescription, the magnetic diffusivity, at least in red giant cores, is a pretty smooth function, and it's larger than the actual viscosity. So that would mean a small magnetic Prandtl number. Um, so I think that's the that's what we expect. But that I know in some other parts of stellar evolution, you may actually have the magnetic diffusivity be smaller than the actual viscosity. I think uh, I think in massive main sequence stars in the cores, that's the case. And I, I also have a question as Daniel Lequane. Um So uh, you showed that with this uh, revised Taylor Sprout um, mechanism with the uh, uh, n over omega to the or omega over n to the to the second power instead of fourth power, uh, you might be able to explain some observations. As we've talked about earlier in the week, there's a concern about uh, right answers for the wrong reason. Yes. Um, and, uh, and and I did want to point out that there's some recent work by Florence Marcotte that we're hoping to hear about uh, later in the program. So um, look out for that. Um, and uh, I've seen a little bit of the data. I'm not going to say too much, but um, but there's uh, they do have some simulations where Omega over n, or n over omega would be about 50. So in that case, I think it would be easy to distinguish between a second power and fourth power. That's like a difference in torques or viscosities by a factor of like a thousand. My understanding is that they favor the original uh, Taylor Sprout dynamo. Yeah, so I'm eagerly awaiting that talk as well. I'm very interested in the results. I do think that this prescription might give you approximately the right answer for the wrong reason. Um, I guess the other thing I want to mention is, if I understand right, 
their simulations have thermal diffusivity, and the scaling law changes if your brunt is basically, if you have a thermal brunt and thermal diffusivity, then the scaling law will change from what's here. So this effective brunt basically depends. If you have a compositional gradient, then the effective brunt becomes basically the compositional brunt. But if you only have a thermal brunt, then the effective brunt changes and this power law will change as well. So that could be related to what's happening there. Yeah, very good point. Uh, there's, there's another question in the chat. I don't want to monopolize things too much, but um, this one's from uh, Louis Amald. Um, how does this new Taylor Spruce uh, transport mechanism compare to the one found by Spada and Lazanfem from or for uh, young low mass stars in clusters? So does it give about the right core envelope coupling time? Yes. It, yeah. So I'm not sure. I suspect it gives too short of a core envelope coupling time. Uh, again, there's, so I haven't run models carefully in that part of uh, evolution, and I haven't looked at the effect of brunt carefully. So uh, an issue there is that actually the, because the rotation rates are large, the thermal diffusivity ends up um, not being as important. And so the, again, the effect of brunt may actually become more like the actual brunt by solid frequency. So this is discussed in our paper, but for red giants, it's not so much an issue, but for these young stars, that may be true. And so, so it, to model those stars, you need to be very careful in how you treat the thermal diffusion and how that affects this effective brunt. And that's something I'd like to do, but haven't done it yet. You have a few more questions in the audience here. Hey, Jim, Evan Anders, thanks for the great talk. Um, at the end, you said that the saturation of the Taylor instability needs to be better understood, and that's one of the things you're looking forward to going forward. So, like, which of the assumptions up here needs the most verification, and um, what needs to happen to make? I it think happen? all of the, all three of these do. Okay. So, like, what exactly produces the nonlinear damping? Uh, how much energy do you actually dissipate? Like, is it the? And this may depend on the geometry of the background field. I think if it's an ordered field, it's very hard to destroy it, but if it's a disordered field, like you have one layer, the magnetic field's going this way, and the other layer, the magnetic field's going this way, then that order, disordered field would be more easy to destroy, so then you'd probably get something like Spreut's picture. Um, and then this ratio of toroidal to poloidal field is also basically an assumption. Um, the argument we make in our paper is that if your radial field is stronger than this ratio, then basically the instability can't occur anymore, because you have a strong enough poloidal field to stabilize the toroidal field. So our argument is that you have some dynamo that amplifies this until it reaches this limit. But that is also not clear. Uh, so yeah, so there's really a lot of uncertainty here. Cool, thanks. Hi, Jim, I'm Binder Tripathi. Thanks for the wonderful review and uh... I have a question about the second equation, which is delta B perp. Is that a, is this a good idea to make a distinction between large scale fluctuation and the small scale fluctuation? Instead of saying there is a mean and the fluctuation, we could still decompose into two components. Yeah, so I'm, I'm making a distinction between like an axisymmetric background field mm -hmm. and then a non-axisymmetric field that you generate through perturbations, mm -hmm. which is large scale still, or at least it's large scale in terms of its horizontal wavelength. Mm -hmm. um, and the assumption, again, behind, it's an assumption that we haven't proven, is that you have some cascade of this energy from large scales to small scales. And if you understand that cascade rate at the large scale and you assume that it all cascades to small scales and dissipates, then this should be about the right answer. But again, this is all um, not very well understood. Yeah, thanks. So we're just about out of time. Is it a, a quick question? Or? Okay. Uh, in that case, let's thank our speaker once again.